to Startup Spotlight, where we explore visionary founders shaping our future. I'm your host for today, Sabina, and today we're diving into a question that I think everyone has on their minds. What will be the future of relationship between artificial intelligence and us humans? And today joining me are three amazing founders that will help us answer this question. So we have Janet from Art Time, we have Gustavo from Rescalers, and Juan from Frankie AI. Now, let's start with some brief introductions. Janet, why don't you start first? Sure, I'm Janet. I am from London, Nigerian-born Londoner. Um, my story is that I had like a really enjoyable career. I was working in music in New York, um, but my dad was home in London and uh, was struggling with dementia. Um, and it was one of the first of many times that I had to sacrifice career for caregiving. So we're developing a product that is going to help people stay in the wet workplace, especially if they have caregiving responsibilities because it has such a big impact on their financial, physical, and emotional health when caregiving takes them away from the workplace. Thank you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Gustavo. Hi, thank you for having me here. I'm Gustavo, I'm from Singapore. So um, yeah, I'm the founder of Rescalers. Um, and my story is that, you know, I when I first started to be an educator and training, and I was so passionate about working, um, with learning effectiveness and to see how I can create the biggest impact on my students. I found myself waking up at 6 a.m. and then not ending my work until like midnight. And that is where I found, and after getting so much work, um, I wasn't being the best of my profitability and it was a perfect recipe for burnout. And so going back to a lot of that discussion on how can I create a platform that allows us to really be um, optimal in terms of um, as, a, as an educator, as a trainer, um, cut down our costs and increase our profitability as a, as a business, because ultimately it is a business. Um, and that is essentially what got us to motivated to build Rescalers, uh, AI powered platform to get everybody more effective. Amazing, nice to have you here, Juan. Hi everyone, thank you for having me. So I'm Juan, I'm from Colombia, and I was working in hospitality, first in consulting, then in a tech company. And I realized that the hospitality workforce is such an underserved demographic, and they're struggling a lot. And what I learned in terms of technology and AI, I thought it would be very cool to empower them with high tech quality tools that they've never had access to. So we started building Frankie, as an HR AI agent that is automating a lot of tasks so that HR teams can do less paperwork and more people work. Thank you very much for your introductions. What I like is that, of course, we can obviously see that all of your products have very tight need between humans and AI. So this is why you three are the perfect people to answer this question. How do you see this relationship between humans and AI evolving in long term, 10, 20 years, and how your companies in particular will contribute to that. And whoever wants to start. So, so in education, we don't believe that um, technology in general should be replacing human at all. I think there is a, a big push and a misunderstanding that um, newly developed AI is going to replace jobs, is going to replace people. And I think it go, always goes back to why was technology created for? Is it to replace or is it to empower people? Um, at Rescalers, we, we believe in creating technology solutions to empower educators so that they can be, you know, having that superpower that they wouldn't have otherwise. Um, a lot of the capabilities that we look at and how do we integrate um, data and capture the right type of insights to make predictive um, information so that the human educators are able to function at their optimal um, capacity. And so from that perspective, I think in the long run, long run, I think and many people might differ from me, um, I do think that technology is here to empower, especially AI to empower humans. Uh, so for me, um, I think we have a choice here. We can be fearful of the future and of AI, or we can realize how much control we have. Um, so I always see it as like, it's something I would agree that can empower us. And the future is really in our own hands of how we use the technology and um, what companies such as uh, our time do is we're very much tech for good and privacy by design, and just aware that there's actions that we can take now to ensure that the impact uh, that we have with AI is very positive and is empowering people. I love that. Yeah, and I agree with Janet and Gustavo. And actually, instead of just like waiting what's going to happen with AI, I think we are building it. And I also feel very connected to the fact that 
we are empowering humans with AI. I would love AI to take care of mundane tasks, what we as humans can be doing, what makes us humans, like uh, solving problems, creativity, love, um, all of this. However, um, I think this is kind of utopic. And I think we as humans, like once we have power, we disconnect from responsibility. So a lot of big companies are, are just building new things, but we are like in this singularity phase of AI. We have no idea what's going to happen. So hopefully is this utopic view we have, but honestly, uh, I think no one knows. Like it's just a lot of predictions. And did you have such a case maybe that you saw other companies and organizations, um, any organizations doing that you thought, oh, that seems a bit odd <laughs> to be using AI for this. Because, for example, I saw a lot of artists and designers saying, oh, but this is the part that we don't want replaced, actually, the artistic part. We want, to, uh, a indeed, AI to replace the mundane tasks and not the creativity one. Did you have such a case that you saw and that rubbed you the wrong way? I think in, in my case and in my industry, uh, I've seen a lot of education through avatars. I think that's amazing. You can streamline a lot of processes, but as Gustavo said, I think, I think there's nothing more powerful than a human teaching another human instead of an avatar teaching a human. So in that side of the education with avatar side, I'm like, I don't know if this is going to be the right path to go. What about you guys? I think um, I've always questioned AI's use in music, um, and that's mainly, you know, I've kind of, I had a music industry career, um, so I'm very close to people who are writing music and composers, and it, I'm not sure whether it's an awful thing that music can be created with AI, but I think it's going back to what Juan was saying about creativity is, you know, a really beautiful thing, so is it the same music when it's created? without human um, interaction or human touch uh, is a question mark. But yeah, that one always like was like, mm, I'm not sure, is that is that what we really want? Yeah, I definitely agree with um, what has been said so far. And I, I would think that AI now is in a space where there's a lot of experimentation. We've seen a lot of that happen with new technology introductions like blockchain and so on. Um, there's so many applications that possibly be used for like music and art um people even use it for you know trying to to give advice uh, and it, all of these things although they seem to be very novel i think over time uh, at this moment it may seem weird but i think over time it will kind of like kind of you know branch out and start to find its own in niche the weirdest part that i found was um um trying to use ai in in trying to design you know concepts for, for work. Um, this is something that we I, traditionally we think of as a very operational, very human um, aspect of it. And, and I saw that to be automated. It was quite fascinating. And for, oh yeah, please. Yeah, so what, to Janet's point, like, I think it's gonna be very, I don't know, new for all of us. Imagine you listen a song and you love it. And then you realize it was created by an AI. So you don't know how are you gonna feel like, I love it, but it's not created by, by humans. So I think that's going to be very weird in the upcoming years. <laughs> well, uh, very excited to see and uh, watch that. But how do your specific solutions make sure that they stay human centric? Because I see that this is still the common theme and common vision that we share. Um, we have a big focus on uh, DEI, diversity and inclusion, and have ensured that there's people who are having a voice and perspective as the companies grow to make sure that we alleviate things like bias. And we have different lived experiences helping to shape how the, the company evolves. Um, so that's been really important to us, uh, ensuring that what we're creating still keeps a human touch or the human element has to come from humans, in my opinion. And how about you guys? Well, as an educator myself and developing solutions with technologies for educators, we as founders as well, we get a lot of control on what gets to be developed or what doesn't get to be developed. Um, and I know certain areas of um, as a trainer, as an as educator, where I, I don't want it to be replaced. I want it to be kept so that it empowers me when I'm standing in front of the students. I have to be reporting to an institution. I have to look at learning, if, uh, you know, how am I going to, you know, really add on my human element to my courses? 
Um, and maybe AI technology and AI isn't the solution to to try to crack that that code. Um, and so we don't waste time in areas where we don't see um, it's gonna really empower the human element. And so every time when me and my team we sit down, it's about looking at is it worth building this, and if it is worth going to solve for this, um, how much of it it's really worth using technology, or it can easily be replaced by just using a human, and can we empower that? And at Frankie, we are building the channel for the workforce to have the opportunity to do th things like giving feedback to their managers. That is something that they never do in this industry. So that's the, the, the way in which we are building technologies, like a bridge to empower them. And at the same time, time to empower managers and HR teams to do, again, less paper mundane work, which is important. It's needed, but it, it's not very impactful and have the time to actually have more human contact, human um, connections and empower the team. Well, that is a very interesting point uh, of view. Um, but I see that you have this vision again. And what I want to ask is what is your, let's say, number one strategy to making sure that in your products, with it, of course, um, influencing that way other products in your industry, this human centric approach is kept. So uh, perhaps that is something about educating the customers that you work with, the organizations, the large organizations, because of course, so we are startups, scale-ups, but then uh, the large organizations, I think, have a completely different agenda. So how do you make sure that you keep that strategy on in your industries? Okay, education. Uh, <laughs> a lot of it for us is getting um educating the, the the customers and and having that relationship understanding what part of their biggest pain um which part is it worthwhile that we we should be coming in with technology and which part is and i know of course as founders i think we're all you know motivated to go and solve and, and cut down the obstacles that it gets them to adopt the technologies that we are developing and so a lot of it is not just developing more user-friendly technology, you know, systems or features. Of course, that will come at some point. But at the beginning, a lot of it is, is getting our hands dirty and, and really engaging with the customers and understanding what is it that is stopping them from switching over from their current processes and then using and adopting a technology like, like ours. And that takes time. That takes a lot of education and a lot of patience on trying to understand what works, what doesn't work. Um, for our time, um, you mentioned a really important word, which is vision. Um, we have this vision of where we want the company to uh, get to in like 10 years, 15 years, this big ambitious vision. And it's actually um, to reconnect people. Our time, the name is about um, sharing of time, uh, rebuilding the village, bringing people back together. We've seen how technology can actually be quite divisive um, and people more behind their devices and less human interaction. So our big, big vision, and we've not worked out how to do it yet, is actually to bring people together so that we have a collaborative community, a collaborative society. And that's where we're aiming for and is really the heartbeat for the, for the business. So we're starting by taking time off people's hands, being able to free them up so that they can do the human in interaction, the human correct connection more. And then the big vision is that we'll actually rebuild communities, bring people back together. So that's like the underlying vision for, for the entire business. Curious. And at Frankie, like I, I spoke to this uh, restaurant owner, a big chain, 300 employees. They are one of the best chains like in Colombia. And we spoke to the owner because they have, they are famous because of their internal culture. And I asked him like, what tools do you use? What this, this and that? And he said, tools, I speak to my people like 101 and it was the first person who told me this so i think at frankie we are trying to do this evangelization process to our current clients and hopefully future clients uh, about how important it is to talk to their people to have these in-person connections while we take care of all the admin tasks and tech tasks they that they still need to do so that's the way in which we try to keep it human-centered your answer actually gave me a very good idea for a question because um, for you, uh, what would be maybe a um, story of one of your customers or a story from your experience that actually inspires you and makes sure that you are on the right way? Because I think this is a very good example of actually talking to a person who is your direct client and seeing 
something from their perspective that perhaps you couldn't see before. And in your case, uh, also very specific cases, of course, people who might be on the verge of uh, burnout or people, um, you know, not everybody is learning the same way. So these are very specific cases. Do you have some examples from your practice? Yes. Um, when we were running our pilots, we also did uh, workshops with employees. We are focused on frontline employees and they um, tend to have a very them and us uh, organizational structure. You've got the head office and HR and then you've got people, you know, feet on the ground, keeping the business moving and are treated unfairly. In addition to that, we also saw that they had things going on in their personal lives that were impacting how they turned up to work. So beyond caregiving, so if you're uh, a parent or you're looking after an elderly relative, people's personal health or folks also came up a lot uh, what were they going through mentally or physically that they weren't able to share with their employer um, and we really want there to be more openness and more understanding because we're all human we're all going through things um, so talking to people and having them uh, able to open up about what was going on in their real lives was was really empowering um, some stories were a lady with endometriosis diagnosis and how she found that very hard to bring to the workplace and have her workplace understand so we want to do things like using data, using information that we have about employees to empower your workforce, to provide training to line managers, more empathetic communication channels, really cut, starts with listening to people and allowing them to open up. And we saw during our research, people wanted to talk about what was going on, but hadn't had the platform to do it, especially not at work. Yeah, um, for us, an actual example of what going back to you know this technology was developed out of a spin-off of our consulting services and so the area that we specialize a lot on the consulting services we de developed a lot of practical training programs um especially in areas like entrepreneurship digital transformations essentially topics that are like future proving your work um and so the technology was essentially developed so to cut down our efficiency cost and you know to improve our profitability I'm, and i'm sitting there so there was this one trip where i traveled to vietnam and I was, in, you know, asked to speak about, you know, how do we use uh, our rescalers as, with an AI component to be able to solve our productivity problems. And there I was talking about, look, you can look at this chart and there is this predictive model and you're going to be able to identify who is going to fail before they even fail. And so after the event, there was this lady um, that approached me and she was like, Gus, I need your system. I was like, what programs are you training? And she actually um, conducts workshops that have 80 to 100 different participants of suicidal patient management um, family members. Now, the, here that I was talking about student failures and learning, she's dealing with potentially human death. And the cost for her to have to follow up and track how every family member has not only learned from her workshop, but how did they apply when they go back home? And the, her ability to be able to cater the personalization services for every single family could essentially determine whether, you know, there's going to be a catastrophic, you know, outcome um, because of certain, you know, mismanagement or, or, or failure. And so that gave me a lot of motivation to see, okay, I know education is broken, but how can we fix so that no student is left behind? Because people like her um, needs to be empowered and so that she's not only saving for people to learn, but also she's essentially saving lives. Great. Yeah, so in terms of something insightful uh, and also impactful was talking to employees in, in the workforce, Latin American workforce, and getting to know their stories and understanding that in LATAM, people are working mostly in restaurants, hotels, not because they are maybe studying something else or it's just a part-time job. It's because sometimes that's the only opportunity they have. So they, this, this workforce haven't had access to formal education. And once we start giving them with the feature of, of training, uh, some context about their job, some context about the company they are working at, about the culture, the mission, they are very empowered because they are not used to getting information and to getting people to care about them. So I think that conversation with employees was extremely impactful for us. I really love all of these use cases. As for a social impact ex-founder, well, I don't know if there are ex-founders ever, but these really touch my heart. But then 
what would be on your way, in your opinion, not only your one number one challenge into achieving this, but maybe even globally, our challenge as a startup bootcamp, as uh, all these innovation ecosystems into achieving this perfect human AI um, complementary relationship. There's a lot of behavior change to mm -hmm. consider. Um, there's a lot of anxiety to consider. Uh, people can be quite happy to be stuck in their ways, whether it's right or wrong. And we have to be able to alleviate any fears that people may have around the technology. So I think that just happens slowly and uh, can't be forced and requires ongoing discussion and evaluation. Um, so for me, it's just like, it's a step-by-step -step process to, to, to reach the vision and just the way it's gonna take time as well. I love that. To me is um, advocacy, is drawing the right crowd of people. I, I think as founder, and I, if I may speak on behalf of you know, founders is, we get so many feedback, so many opinion, and everybody has an advice when we are out there. And yes, we started with this big vision and we have this big impact that we want to create. But then at every point in time, there are um, a constant sort of evaluation whether you know the information that we are receiving is, the, is it correct or is it going to send us in a very different uh, rabbit hole. Just being part of the Startup Bootcamp um, program, it gives us so many resources to be able to talk to so many mentors and experts. But at the same time, there's so many opinions and different directions that, that our business could go through. And I find that um, rather challenging to be able to decipher, you know, what what is actual insight and what is actual um, noise. And the constant balancing of that, it's, it's, it's a mix of being time consuming, but also in terms of um, of, of you know asking yourself you know am, am I blinking in the, making the wrong decision here and so um, I guess the the for me is getting more involved in an ecosystem like this and getting more points I think sometimes spending that extra five minutes just to really validate whether that opinion was or, or that suggestion was really uh, valid or was it just something that I should re disregard in a time where I need to be focused and I have such short period of time to prove my pr product market fit, um, that to me is probably going to be the next biggest challenge. I think the, the challenge for us, it will be like the way to approach this challenge is with super hyper, hyper active listening and active listening also means filtering what you hear from who you hear it. So we have a lot of advice of you should do this, like let's say for Frankie, you should come to Europe, you should stay in Latin, you should go to US, you should start in this other industry, which is bigger. You should do this, this and that. And at first it was very overwhelming until I understood it's good to hear. I don't need to apply it. And I always need to filter what is the motivation for this person? What is the background from this person? And what is our context? And just try to, to filter as much as possible. Same with the clients, just listen very carefully, constantly. And I think it's all about listening and reading into lines. That's the way to overcome the challenge. Well, I think these are all very valid. And I also do love already the suggestions on how to overcome those. And I do have this belief that as people in innovation ecosystem, we will uh, make a breakthrough. But now from your side, for me, for our audience, what is one thing, one advice that you want to give on how we can also help make smaller steps perhaps towards this uh, beautiful vision that you guys have. One step that um, any of us can take in our regular or work life. I will say that instead of just waiting what's gonna happen and just predicting it, start building what you want to happen. What, you, what your vision of how you can help with AI now or whatever you're, you're building um, can be in the future. Like build the future that, that you want and for people who are not building anything, I think, um, and for all of us, I think it's super important to always, again, read into lines, not only see the news, like this company just launched um, this AI glasses, like try to go deeper, understand, okay, what's gonna be, what's gonna happen, and, and try to be in touch with everything that's happening from the lenses of going into lines and not just absorbing information. So what first came to mind when you asked that question um, was to really realize how much we are in control of this technology. Um, 
so um, giving my kids a phone has been like really controversial. They're too young, they're too, but I'm like, no, actually, I'm in control of that device. So I'll set up how it's used, what apps are on there, and it's like pretty much a glorified walkie-talkie. <laughs> it doesn't do very much, but then I don't have to worry about what they're seeing on there and what they're doing on there. Um, so that's to say that we are in control of how this evolves and ensuring that there is a, a human element. Um, to how AI evolves. So we have to take the proactive steps to ensure that we're in control. In, in the context of AI, for especially in, in the technologies that we are we're building um, for founders that are listening, to me is if you have a dream and you want to experiment, um, there's no better time than to go out and do it. I mean, this is for one time, if you compare it like 10 years ago, all the infrastructural you know, needs the the power, the the technology, and and uh, is all within your reach. So, as a founder, I know I struggled a lot uh, at the beginning in terms of like when should I go out and and start developing and adopting technology and developing solutions for that. If you have a problem that you want to solve, whether you want to use AI, you want to use blockchain or any sort of technology, just go out and do it. There's no don't wait. There's no better time. I love that advice. Well, thank you very much, Janet, Gustavo, Juan. Thank you very much for sharing your stories. I think and I hope that our listeners also enjoyed it, got a little bit inspired as well, because this episode was actually not only educational, but inspiring. Thank you for doing what you're doing and good luck to you. And to our listeners, thank you very much. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you do enjoy episodes like this and content like this, then join our Startup Bootcamp ecosystem if you haven't already. Whether you're an investor and you want to explore investments in startups or you want to mentor them or you're a founder yourself, go to startupbootcamp.org, explore upcoming events, explore the programs that we have, still open applications for, Join us at the next event, follow us on social media, and I'm sure that we will find a place for you in our vibrant ecosystem. And until then, remember, innovation will save the world.